Hello everybody, uh, you're listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. And I'm Joan. Fantastic. Uh, so, uh, we are back, and uh, it is the first episode we are recording in the month of May, and so uh, we're going to tell you about some of the very interesting studies that caught our eye uh, during uh, last month, which was April. Um, before we jump in, um, you know, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Um, I've been working hard on our series, as always. <laughs> and uh, I had mentioned during our last episode that I had started reading Tom Higgum's The World Before Us. Mm. And I basically got through the whole thing in a week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I enjoyed it so much that I, I literally couldn't put it down. You know, I was, I was turning out two to four chapters a day. And by the time I was done, I'm like, it's only been a week, hasn't it? <laughs> I guess I really like this. And um, yeah, I guess as far as my, like, my little mini review is concerned, yeah, I really did enjoy this. Um, Tom Higgum really knows how to craft good stories, and, and his mix of anecdotes about, you know, his adventures at different fossil sites in Eurasia, and, like, the key discoveries of certain fossils really ties in well to, like, the general facts that he talks about regarding what we know of the humans who shared the world with us during the last 100,000 years or so. So, yeah, Higgum is one of the, you know, the world's experts on Denisovans, you know, he's worked with many of the Denisovan samples and he's been crucial to a lot of the dating and genetic studies that we have to kind of give us information about these humans that, I mean, we really, like all, all that we know for the most part about Denisovans is from just a couple fossils, mm -hmm. but like they're, the DNA in the fossils has just opened up so many doors that we can we can talk about things like physical appearance and and and, and demographic history and, and even some aspects of culture that otherwise if we didn't have any of those things and we 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 wouldn't even consider talking about that kind of stuff right. you know it, it's really remarkable how far paleoanthropology has come and i guess paleontology in general because i mean these, these sorts of studies work very well for other organisms um and I, I just, it was kind of cool to see sort of the, the state of affairs, because this book is very, very new. So, you know, the current state of affairs on, on Homo floresiensis and then what's up with them. Uh, Homo luzonensis, of course, gets a couple mm -hmm. pages mentioned, um, as well as some of the new discoveries about Denisovans. You know, the idea that, that, you know, there were very different populations all throughout Eurasia, including some that probably hopped over Wallace's line and hung out in New Guinea and the Melanesian Islands for a hot minute. And so contributed to the DNA of a lot of the uh, Homo sapiens who live there now. Right. And so that was particularly nice. And uh, yeah, I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, if you're in the UK, which is where it's been out, you know, definitely pick yourself a copy. If you're not in the UK, you can do what I did <laughs> yeah, and just that's 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 to you. you know, <laughs> I, I couldn't wait for this one, and I'm, I'm glad that I didn't. So there's that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's great to hear, and a very glowing review, clearly. Um, yeah, that that sounds fantastic. I will have to check it out when I get the chance, but uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I got a lot of other books I need to read first. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's always a struggle. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I, I mean, as for me, I, I guess not too much has happened since the last time we, we recorded. Uh, I'm still just kind of busy in general with the research and uh, working on my thesis and stuff like that but uh yeah no, nothing I, I really have to report I'm, I'm still doing all right and doing reasonably well so uh, uh i i'm excited to to talk about these news stories yeah we got some good ones today <laughs> again it's, it's another another tough month for us it, it was pretty tough yeah there there were quite a few choices to, to pick from um but uh yeah eventually eventually we uh, made our decisions uh, as we always do and uh Let's uh let's have a look. Let's see. I think the first one is one of yours. Yeah. All fact, right. The, the the first two. They were um, true. <laughs> it just so happens that you know two really neat papers came out last month that had to do with the Precambrian. You know the the famous stretch of Earth's history before you know all the fun stuff happened. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the Precambrian is pretty fun. Um, but I I figured it'd be appropriate to cover them both together, and uh, I'll. I'll do that fairly as brief as I can. Um, so first up is a paper by Hamed Gamal El Dien and colleagues about the beginnings of plate tectonics. 
So, we have a fairly good understanding about how plate tectonics got started here on Earth. You know, our planet went through several successive stages during its formation uh, based upon the weight of the minerals and rocks that comprised the early Earth. At one point, it had a molten peridotite crust that solidified and then sank towards the mantle, uh, towards the mantle uh, because it was made of dense rock. But during this process, lighter basalt rocks rose up in great eruptions to form a new crust. And today, the ocean floor is made mostly of this basalt crust. And yet, the continental crust is made of a different rock, granite. It turns out that granite is even less dense than basalt, you know, having emerged from the latter rock through high-temperature, water-facilitated melting. And uh, these new granite rocks would have pushed themselves upwards through the basalt crust, reaching the surface of the newborn ocean at ever-increasing quantities to produce larger and larger landmasses that we could call proto-continents. Now, the bottoms of tectonic plates are associated with mantle remixing, so whereby uh, rocks and minerals form the crust, or the ones that, that do form the crust, are subducted into the mantle and then recycled for later use. Uh, we generally understood how this process started. Um, you know, heat from the Earth's radioactive core began to drive convection currents in the mantle that would push the oceanic crust to and fro and you know, produce new basalt crust as the old basalt crust is brought downwards. You know, these would have formed ridges and boundaries that eventually gave us the first tectonic plates, mm -hmm. you know, carrying continents of granite crust and sea floors of basalt crust. And then, of course, the rest is history. Uh, but the biggest discourse, however, was when did this start? You know, how soon or how late after the formation of the Earth did plate tectonics begin? And that's where this study comes in. Uh, the authors stated with a, you know, they, they, oh, they, they started with a basic premise. You know, prior to the start of this mantle remixing, the mantle would have been a homogenous composition of rocks and minerals, you know, like you'd expect during a time when the crust was you know, a simple layer of basalt with some granite islands piled on top of it. Uh, but with remixing, the mantle would look like a mess. So it'd be heterogeneous. So all you'd have to do is look at really old Precambrian rocks and find traces of this recycling. And that's what the authors did. Uh, so they performed this worldwide investigation. Uh, they, they looked at samples of basalt crust from five different continents uh, and, you know, and their associated cratons, you know, as you can see in the image at the top right here, um, as well as samples of comatites. Now, these are volcanic rocks that are formed you know, very early in Earth's history. So like the, the Archean Eon. And they're now very rare today because the mantle is actually cooled enough that you can't really make these kinds of rocks yeah. anymore. <laughs> um, so, you know, studying rocks like that can give you really good clues about, you know, the early mantle and the early crust. And the evidence they found by comparing the over 6,000 samples that they took and looking at the changes in their chemistry, they showed that mantle remixing was occurring at roughly 3.2 billion years ago. So that puts these oldest samples at the start of the Mesoarchaean era. Uh, that's about 1.4 billion years after the formation of the Earth. So that at best gives us a minimum date for the start of plate tectonics. You know, the you know, this significantly narrows down the previous estimates that we had. Mm -hmm. You know, you had folks that were arguing for, you know, soon after the Earth's formation at 4 billion years ago to, you know, later at 2 billion years ago. And you had some folks who were like, oh, 700 million years mm -hmm. ago, which is like, whoa, hang on a sec. Um, but yeah, <laughs> you know, certainly we can anticipate, you know, more work to see if, you know, even earlier evidence of this plantal mantle remixing can be found. Mm -hmm. But at the very least, you know, uh, this gives us a great start. So that, that's pretty cool, don't you think? Oh, yeah, totally. Right. So uh, now this next study concerns uh, Precambrian organisms. You know, it's by uh, Xu Xiang Zhang and colleagues. Now, uh, I whipped up this simple, very simple phylogeny here at the bottom right mm -hmm. for you all I like to it. see. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luca 
uh, stands for the last universal common ancestor of all life on Earth today, uh, who was probably around as far back as 4.5 billion years ago, so not long after the planet formed. There's been a lot of discourse about that, but you know, we're finding earlier and earlier evidence of life appearing like that after the planet's formation, so that's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, two main splits, you know, divided life on Earth. You got the bacteria and the archaea, so the single-celled prokaryotic organisms. At some point, at least prior to 1.7 billion years ago, according to the fossil record, um, primary endosymbiosis occurred. So that's where you had this alpha proteobacterium that was ingested by an archaean, um, but not digested. And you know this, this fantastic journey gave us the ancestors of mitochondria, and thus the origin of eukaryotic life, which you can see here in blue. Now you fast forward through the many complex branches of this family tree, which were, you know, it seems like every other month there, they're changing the, <laughs> the branching points. Um, and you reach a, another endosymbiotic event with cyanobacteria uh, and with, with eukaryotic cells. And uh, that gives uh, those particular organisms photosynthetic abilities. So thus by 1.5 um, billion years ago, the descendants of this fusion became the first plants, or, or archaeplastids, as they're called. Mm -hmm. And these consist primarily of two major lineages, the red algae and the green algae. Basically, most of the seaweeds and, and things in pond scum that, uh, you would, uh, that you might be familiar with. Now, uh, despite the importance that organisms like these hold uh, for ecosystems today, mainly providing much of the oxygen we breathe, and supporting like the oceanic food web, so you know not exactly small tasks. Um, it was traditionally thought that these plants didn't begin to underpin primary production until very late in the Precambrian, uh, around 780 million years ago. Uh, prior to this, you know, we figured organisms like cyanobacteria and uh, other photosynthetic prokaryotes and eukaryotes were mostly in charge of this and that the red and green algae were relatively small on the world stage, almost mm. insignificant. Uh, but not so, says Zhang Yitao. Uh, it turns out red and green algae leave particular biomarkers in the rocks. And you can sample and test these layers to see not only whether these plants were present, but how productive they were. Uh, the authors studied rocks from the Zhamaling Formation, uh, which is in northern China, and it dates to about 1.4 billion years ago. So that's uh, in the Mesoproterozoic era. And they managed to retrieve organic compounds by superheating the samples uh, through this uh, process of high temperature pyrolysis. And in doing so, the authors found that these biomarkers that they recovered indicated an unusually high presence of both red and green algae during this time. Hmm. And that tells us that these algae were likely playing a much larger role in the environment much earlier in time than we previously thought. Uh, the authors state clearly, however, that while this discovery is still impressive, you know, much of the primary production in the ocean during the Mesoproterozoic would still have been from cyanobacteria mm -hmm. and other and other like-minded critters. Um, and, uh, you know... <laughs> So then just what was it that led to the rise in red and green algae that we see today? You know, why is it like this and not like it was before? Well, it all comes down to phosphorus, uh, which is important for the growth of plants and the formation of bony skeletons. Generally, cyanobacteria and other microbial photosynthesizers tend to live in phosphorus-limiting environments, while larger multicellular red and green algae prefer high phosphorus environments. Now, while these particular models are still debated, it seems that phosphorus levels were fairly low during much of the Precambrian, uh, you know, only climbing to higher levels in some regions, at least, later on. You know, this being the, uh, the 780 million year old mark that uh, we had previously used to link with the rise in multicellular algae. Uh, but what would have happened is, you know, as grazing microbes evolved that could feast on photosynthetic bacteria for the first time, you know, their waste 
would have began to fertilize the oceans mm. and, and make it more phosphorus rich, you know, thus allowing for the proliferation of the then rare red and green algae that we see today. And, you know, th this is the general model we have, mm -hmm. but we still need more concrete evidence for it. Uh, but in any case, I think, you know, the, the, the high presence of multicellular algae so far back in time does change our understanding of the Mesoproterozoic in a fairly strong way. Mm -hmm. uh, Albert, what do you think? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, these are definitely both very interesting studies. I mean, the uh, yeah, pre-Cambrian uh, spans such a huge amount of time in the history of the Earth, um, but we, we don't hear much about it, or we tend to gloss over it. And uh, So pretty much anything that kind of clarifies our uh, views of what happened when and yeah exactly like, you know what what events were actually going on during that time and it's, it's all really valuable research well i think so too and I'm, I'm glad you think so um and of course for all of our fans who have watched our show before you can go back to our oh we had another <laughs> new show where we basically outlined the whole precambrian for y'all <laughs> we, we did yeah yeah might have been might have been one we did for november or uh yeah we'll we'll have to go back and check but but uh but yeah we, we've definitely covered this before on the show <laughs> oh yeah i think in that context it was a proposal for a new time scale that's right yeah cool. yeah but it would have tweaked things a bit to make it match more with what we now know about the precambrian you know, stuff right. like this so uh yeah definitely uh if anything we'll find it we'll, we'll post a link in the description again yeah um mm. But uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about these precambrian studies. Uh, right. We could go to your first story now, if you like. Oh, sure. Uh, all right. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, all right. So uh, my stories, like, both, both of my stories actually uh, take place uh, around the same time and place, really. Um, mm -hmm. And that is uh, much more recently than the precambrian. Um, so uh, still still millions of years ago, though. Uh, this, this, we're, we're talking about a Cretaceous fossil here, an early Cretaceous fossil. Um, roughly 120 million years old. And so this is a new specimen that came out of the very uh, famous uh, Zhehe Biota of uh, China. And so this is a, a series of uh, geologic formations that preserves uh, a lot of exquisite fossils, um, uh, especially of the small-bodied vertebrates, although there are, there are a lot of great uh, invertebrate fossils and plant fossils from there too. Um, but uh, definitely the kind of news making uh, specimens tend to be the vertebrates especially uh, these really complete specimens with soft tissues and of course uh, famously the um, the Zhehe biota was um, where we found kind of the first confirmed uh, feathered non-avian dinosaur specimens and uh, that has continuously put it in the spotlight ever since um, and there are there are other types of vertebrates that get found there too like early mammals and uh, uh, amphibians and uh, non-dinosaurian reptiles um, so uh, it's definitely a very, very rich uh, fossil deposit, a, a gift that keeps on giving. Um, and so uh, today we're, we're going to talk about yet another new feathered dinosaur specimen um, from, uh, from one of these formations. Um, but uh, the main uh, kind of um, interesting thing about this specimen is not so much of feathers, even though they're, they're pretty cool, um, but uh, more about what it what tells us about the origins of the growth patterns of, of birds or these um well what the growth patterns of birds uh, was like in kind of early early ancestors of modern birds um so this new specimen uh, belongs to a uh, genus of early cretaceous uh, bird like dinosaurs called uh, archaeorhynchus and um archaeorhynchus is not one of the more famous um, dinosaurs from the um the joho biota um it, it is uh is quite closely related to modern birds um it is a member of the group Euornithes. So Euornithes includes modern birds and also everything more closely related to them than to the um, opposite birds or Enantiornithians. Um, so the Enantiornithes were one of the most successful groups of like bird-like um, dinosaurs uh, during the Cretaceous. Uh, they span like a wide range of shapes and sizes and probably ecologies as well and uh, they are among the more common kind of uh, fossils of near bird dinosaurs that you can find in cretaceous deposits um, but uh, they went completely extinct at the end of the cretaceous 
and uh, they they were very bird like uh, they could they could fly if you saw them in life they you would consider them to be birds basically um and uh, they probably occupied ecological niches similar to a lot of uh, modern birds, like maybe small insect eaters in the trees and so on. That seems to have been a very common uh, ecological niche of the um, uh, species we find in the Zhehe biota. But um, members of Euronithes are the group that are, includes modern birds and are more closely related to them than to the um, opposite birds. Um, so, as you might imagine, these are even more kind of modern bird-like in many ways. Like, overall, uh, if you saw one of these in life, you definitely would consider it a modern bird. Um, if you saw one of these non-modern uh, non bird Euornithians, um, they, they would basically be what you'd consider a bird to be, unless you got very close enough uh, to see some of the very small minor differences. Um, so, most... Uh, of the Euronithians other than modern birds did have teeth, uh, so you might have heard of things like Hesperornis or Ichthyornis, they are uh, members of this group that were not modern birds and still retained teeth. Um, but uh, as it turns out, Archaeorhynchus is actually a species uh, that uh, independently lost teeth, so it actually has a tooth to speak. Um, but it is, it is convergent with um, modern birds because uh, it is not as closely related to modern birds as things like Ichthyornis or Hesperornis, both the uh, late Cretaceous species. Uh, in fact, Archaeorhynchus is probably uh, one of the most distantly related to modern birds uh, among Euronithes. So it evolved this tooth to speak convergently. And uh, it's a uh, I guess in terms of the shape of its beak, it's a, it's a, it looks like a pretty generalist beak. It's a uh, I would guess vaguely chicken-like. It's not, not particularly long. It's a kind of short, uh, uh, short beak, and the the tip, if you see it from the top or from the bottom, is kind of rounded. Um, from the side, is a little pointed, um, and you can kind of see this in the new specimen too. Uh, it's the the skull is preserved from the from the side. And Archaeorhynchus is known from several um, specimens. Uh, several of those specimens are uh, sub-adults, so they are almost you know, full-grown, but not quite. Uh, and we also have one uh, adult specimen that has been described as well. And they, they are all pretty complete specimens, like essentially complete or nearly complete uh, skeletons. Uh, some of them have feathers. There's even one that preserves a lung tissue, which is, wow, that, that, that's amazing lung. even for a Zhehe fossil. Yeah, like <laughs> uh, that, that one is really cool too. Um, and so it, it is actually pretty well represented in the fossil record, Archaeorhynchus. Uh, in terms of size, it is about the size of a pigeon or so. Um, in general, the early Cretaceous uh, Euornithians were larger than uh, the opposite birds. So like most of the early Cretaceous opposite birds, we find at the same kinds of uh, uh, sites. Um, they are very small birds, like um, sparrow-sized. Um, and if they're, if they're a little bigger, maybe the size of a a thrush, like American robin or U European blackbird, um, whereas the uh, Euronithians tend, tend to be tend to range into uh, larger sizes um, in in this time period. Um, so Archaeorhynchus is about the size of a, a pigeon, and there there are plenty of other early Cretaceous Euronithians that got bigger than that, like uh, around the size of a chicken, for example. Um, they also seem to have been a lot less um, arboreal, less tree dwelling than the Enantiornithians at this time. Uh, so things like Archaeorhynchus, like the, the claws on their feet, uh, are kind of uh, not very curved. The curvature is very low, and um, their hallux, the hind toe in, in birds that typically used for grasping, uh, it tends to be pretty small in the early Euronithians. So most of them are probably pretty ground dwelling birds. In fact, we think a lot of them were um, associated with water. Uh, some of them seem to have eaten fish, uh, maybe swam around even. Um, and uh, whereas the Enantiornithians, um, a lot of them had very strongly curved claws, very well developed uh, halluses, uh, plural of hallux. Um, so uh, they, they seem to have been more uh, tree-dwelling birds, so we see this kind of ecological segregation between these two groups. Um, and Archaeorhynchus, with its uh, tooth to speak, uh, it's hard to tell exactly what it was what it was eating, but uh, pretty much all the specimens we found so far, until this one, uh, have uh, uh, lots and lots of little um, gizzard stones uh, it's preserved inside their gut cavity. Um, so yeah, they, they were, uh, like, like a lot of modern birds today, they seem to have ingesting been ingesting a lot of uh, little pebbles and small rocks and stones uh, to help with their digestion, to help them grind up their food. Um, and that's that's pretty common in birds that eat uh, fairly kind of fibrous uh, foods, like seeds and such. So maybe that's what Archaeorhynchus was doing. Um, 
But uh, in any case, uh, we did have all, you know, this range of really nice specimens from Archaeorhynchus previously. Uh, but uh, what we didn't have was a really young juvenile specimen. In fact, we don't really have many, you know, re really any uh, uh, really young juveniles of early Cretaceous Evernithians um, until now. And so this new specimen that was just described uh, is a young juvenile of Archaeorhynchus. Um, and it so far gives us uh, our best look at uh, kind of what the growth pattern of these early you know, bird-like dinosaurs was like, uh, which is pretty significant because the, the growth pattern in modern birds is very distinctive, and in fact it is quite different from some of their close relatives in the fossil record uh, that have been studied so far. Um, modern birds have some of the highest growth rates of any kind of vertebrate. Uh, they can reach um, adult size in a matter of weeks, um, and so super, super fast um, uh, growth. Uh, whereas uh, in most uh, non-bird dinosaurs, and even even in groups that are very, very bird-like, like the um, Enantiornithians, uh, people have kind of sectioned their bones to see how how long it took for them to grow. And it turns out that uh, for most non-bird dinosaurs, even though they were fairly fast growers compared to, say, um, cold-blooded um, animals like non-dinosaurian reptiles, um, they would have still taken several years to get to adult size. Yeah, more and more like a, a lot of mammals, at least. Um, so kind of the origin of when this super fast modern growth rate emerged uh, is a, has been a bit of a mystery. Uh, we do start seeing them in groups that are very, very close to, uh, to modern birds. So things like Ichthyornis seems to have gone through like very rapid uh, growth rates. Um, but yeah, kind of if you go a little bit more distant from that, kind of in, in the range of species that are uh, less close to modern birds and ichthyornis but closer than the enantiornithians uh it, it's been hard to hard to tell because we don't really have a lot of juvenile specimens um now people have sectioned the older um archaeorhynchus specimens and found that they took i, I think at least um three years to to grow to adult size so uh yeah they they definitely uh, were pretty fast growers but not not as fast as modern birds but uh even so we, we don't really that doesn't really tell us kind of what kind of um, changes like, they went through in their very early uh, ontogeny or growth um, series. So finally, having this little uh, juvenile with us uh, tells us a um, uh, thing or two about that. Um, so this specimen, uh, we identified as a juvenile, or the, uh, the rather the authors identified it as a juvenile uh, due to various features. Um, a lot of the bones in the skeleton are unfused, which are you know, pretty... Um, fairly universal kind of uh, juvenile growth characteristics across vertebrates. Like if you allow the bones that should be fused are not fused, uh, that, that's a pretty pretty good signal that this is probably a juvenile. Um, and in, in birds, a lot of the bones should be fused. Um, for example, the carpometacarpus, which are the long bones in the hand, uh, fused to some of the wrist bones uh, in adults. Uh, in this juvenile, the, the wrist bones and the and the metacarpals are not fused together, and the metacarpals are, are not fused to each other either, which they normally are in uh, adult birds. Um, the tibiotarsus, which is the shin bone and some of the ankle bones, is also not fused here. Um, and the metatarsals, um, the long bones of the foot, are usually uh, fused together into kind of one bone in, in birds as well. And again, they are not fused here. So this seems to have been, been an early uh, juvenile. Um, and specifically among the Zhehe biota, which is composed of several rock formations, it is from the Jovo Tang formation, which is uh, uh, the youngest, uh, the youngest uh, rock formation in this kind of series of assemblages. Um, so this is the same formation that gave us things like uh, Microraptor. Uh, Microraptor was a smaller relative of Velociraptor, uh, with uh, known from some spectacular uh, specimens, including some that preserve feathers on uh, both its front and hind limbs, like big flight feathers um, on, on all four limbs. Um, probably uh, was capable of some kind of flight to some extent, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, Microraptor is probably the, the most famous um, animal from the Jofu Tang formation. Um, but it, it's given us a lot of other uh, feathered dinosaur fossils as well. Um, and so let's see. Let's have a look at uh, this uh, this particular specimen. Uh, it is fairly complete. Uh, this Archaeorhynchus uh, is only missing uh, things like the sternum, the breastbone, and the end of the tail. Uh, most of the other major limb bones are there. Um, and of course, it preserves uh, some feathers, uh, specifically the wing feathers. And something you'll notice here is that the wing feathers are quite large. You can see the dark stains on the rock. Like the, those are the those are the wing feathers. Um, 
which is uh, quite unexpected if this was a modern bird, because uh, modern birds, uh, they, they don't usually gain the power to be able to fly with you know, large enough wings until uh, they are skeletally mature, that is, all their bones are fused up and they're basically adults uh, in terms of their, you know, their skeleton growth. Um, Whereas uh, Archaeorhynchus, uh, this juvenile, it, even though a lot of its skeleton is unfused, it already has these really large wings. So perhaps uh, it, it might have already been able to fly, and even if it wasn't, it, this clearly um, suggests that uh, the ability to fly kind of uh, came in earlier before the ability, to, or rather the, um, the fusion of the, the skeleton. Uh, that is uh, very interesting. So these um, early bird-like dinosaurs, they grew slower than modern birds in terms of their skeleton, but they seem to have been able to achieve flight earlier, which is very cool. And uh, Archaeorhynchus is actually not the first kind of um, uh, Mesozoic dinosaur to uh, exhibit this trait. Uh, we have uh, juveniles from a lot of the um, opposite birds, um, or these juvenile specimens from opposite birds. Uh, they're often hard to assign to specific species. Um, and they also show a very similar pattern where uh, the skeletal growth is much slower than modern birds, taking them several years to grow to uh, kind of adult uh, skeletal maturity. But uh, they seem to have had very large wing feathers very early in their ontogeny, and so were probably able to fly very early. Um, and uh, in addition to these uh, kind of juvenile traits, uh, this specimen of Archaeorhynchus also seems to tell us something about the diet in this bird because there are these rounded structures uh, preserved inside its gut cavity, mm -hmm. uh, and these don't seem to be um, gizzard stones, unlike the um, uh, older specimens, but uh, instead probably some kind of um, plant seed or, or maybe some kind of similar plant material. Um, so this might be the first direct evidence that this, um, this species actually ate seeds, and that, that's also pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I think those, those are kind of the, the main uh, talking points about this specimen. Uh, do you have any thoughts? Oh, it's a beautiful specimen for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, it really, uh, really is a, yet another uh, kind of winning <laughs> specimen from, from this biota. Um, yeah, and uh, definitely, um, it it didn't get a whole lot of press, so uh, that that's kind of kind of why I decided to cover it yet here, because uh, of course normally it's like, oh yeah, yet yet another feathered dinosaur specimen. We've already seen those uh, in a dozen <laughs> in a dozen nature papers or so. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, Archaeorhynchus in general, even though it's known from these really good specimens, and it's in this really um, kind of um, interesting phylogenetic position to uh, relative to modern birds. Uh, you know, it's in a pretty good position to help us understand uh, modern bird evolution, but uh, yeah, it doesn't doesn't get get in much press. So uh, I think it's uh, it's nice to kind of draw attention to it for this. Um, and I, I guess if you need to um, orient yourself on the figure here, the the top left is the the original um, specimen as it is. Um, so the, these specimens, even though they're beautifully preserved and very complete, uh, can be pretty hard to interpret because they're usually preserved very flattened, and so all the elements are all crushed together. Um, and so you, you might look at this and just see just a mad jumble um, of, of stuff. And yeah, it, it, it can be pretty difficult. Um, you, you really have to see them in person. Uh, but um, on the uh, top right uh, is showing the specimen uh, being photographed under kind of a filtered light so that uh, some of the elements fluoresce. Um, and so kind of, this is kind of a way to make some of the um, uh, preserved elements pop up more uh, visually um, because certain um, materials uh, fluoresce in different ways than others. And so, for example, here you see the, the bones fluorescing in red. Um, and so that, that can help people uh, kind of make out the details a bit better. And on the bottom is a, is a sketch based on the specimen. And so that, that should uh, also help you uh, figure out what's what on this specimen. Yeah. Now, uh, I have one more slide on this. Uh, this is a figure from the paper, uh, basically uh, doing a restoration of uh, a different specimens of Archaeorhynchus of different uh, growth stages. And so a little baby a juvenile that was just newly described in this paper is, the, of course, the, the small uh, leftmost uh, individual. Um, and since it has uh, wing feathers preserved, it, the artist drew in a kind of wing feathers proportionate to what we know in the fossils. Um, and then you can see a subadult specimen in the middle there. Uh, and we also have subadults with uh, the wing feathering preserved. And so that, that has also been drawn in. Um, 
And finally, the, the one adult specimen that we have uh, does not preserve feathers, and so they kind of made the, uh, the feathers uh, grayed out and translucent here uh, to reflect that. But uh, kind of speculatively, uh, you would expect the, the wing feathers to be a little bigger in, in the fully grown adult, and so that, that's what's being depicted there. And they also cut away to show the skeleton, just, I guess, to show the, um, the different um, levels of skeletal fusion um, in these different growth stages. Um, yeah, something else that's uh, visible here and it's interesting about Archaeorhynchus uh, is that if you look at the adult specimen, you can see the tail feathers are drawn um, in a way that there are these two particularly long tail feathers that kind of extend out from the center of what we call a tail fan. Um, and so in, in modern birds, the tail is very short, uh, just like it is in Archaeorhynchus. Um, and there are these uh, large uh, flight feathers that come off the tail and these muscles that kind of surround the, the tail vertebrae um, or like they, they sit on they sit on top of the tail vertebrae and when they contract they can spread the tail feathers out like a fan which helps them kind of maneuver in flight and it is um in Euornithes that this uh, feature actually evolved so we we do know that uh, in groups more distantly related to modern birds a lot of dinosaurs um, with feathers had large feathers on their tail uh, but there isn't any evidence that they had this kind of complex um, uh, muscle structure associated with it that would help them uh, use a tail in very um, you know fine uh, maneuvers in, in flight or anything like that um, and besides uh, a lot of the a lot of the non-bird dinosaurs could, couldn't fly anyways um, and, but um, in, in your nithies we start seeing this uh, very modern bird like feature and uh, yeah th this is definitely one of the reasons you would definitely consider an early your nithian to be a bird if you, if you saw one in life um, and so uh, it turns out that this particular um, depiction of the tail of Archaeorhynchus it is actually based on direct evidence. So not, not in the adult specimen, which again doesn't preserve feathers, but in one of the subadult specimens, um, the same one that preserves the lung tissue, uh, it actually preserves the tail feathers and shows this kind of morphology with the two central long tail feathers and shorter uh, feathers to either side of those that pair. Um, so in this way, uh, this is kind of called a pin tail uh, arrangement of the tail feathers with this central, central pair of long narrow feathers. Um, and it, it is seen in some uh, modern birds, like uh, some types of ducks. There, there are a few ducks that are called pintails, actually. Um, and so they, they have this kind of uh, a very similar kind of tail to this. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. And uh, the, the central kind of elongated tail feathers uh, most likely were probably for, for display because... Um, yeah, it, just just having like two feathers sticking out of the middle of a fan there, it does, doesn't really um, uh, do much for affecting kind of flight maneuvers um, or anything, but uh, they, they do make them a little more showy. So I, I guess the, our, our um, kind of expectation would be that uh, this was a display structure in Archeorhynchus. So yeah, um, all in all, uh, it's really cool to find out more about this um, particular species. And it is very cool to find out more about uh, the growth patterns in these early uh, bird-like dinosaurs in general. Um, it seems that uh, if, we, if we take this information um, uh, most parsimoniously, uh, since the opposite birds in Archeorhynchus both have a very similar kind of growth strategy where the skeletal maturity happens slower than modern birds, but the flight feathers grow in much quicker, um, this might have been ancestral uh, to to modern birds. Uh, well, this might be an, uh, this might have been something that happened along the ancestral line le leading to modern birds, and so modern birds went through this phase of uh, being kind of uh, being able to to fly early, but uh, having slow uh, skeletal growth. Um, and in, in modern day, there you know there there are almost no comparable examples of this in, in modern birds. Uh, but there is one particular group, uh, the megapodes, which are a group of uh, chicken-like birds um, that have a sort of similar growth strategy. Um, basically, very shortly after they hatch, like within days um, or even hours, uh, they are able to fly. They they are hat they hatch with a very well-developed uh, wing feathers, um, and uh, they don't they don't take quite as long as the opposite birds or Archaeorhynchus to grow to adult size, but uh, they, they do take longer than other um, uh, modern birds do. Um, and so it seems uh, something similar probably was happening here. Uh, and the, the thing about um, the megapodes is that they basically don't receive a parental care after they hatch. Um, they have a very unusual kind of reproductive strategy, um, well, which we don't think was present in um, you know, non-modern bird dinosaurs necessarily, but uh, 
per perhaps tells us something about post-hatching care, uh, because the, these young are basically self-sufficient after they hatch. They, they don't really receive parental care um, after they hatch, although the, the parents, parent megapodes will bury the eggs um, underground or under leaf litter and allow the kind of um, either decaying leaf litter or geothermal heat to incubate the eggs. And they will also check on the nest every now and then to make sure the temperature is just right and remove or add material as needed. Now, we don't think this happened in a non-modern um, bird dinosaurs necessarily, because it seems to be something special. The mound building seems to be something special um, uh, that evolved in megapodes, uh, because we have nests of things like opposite birds that don't, don't show this kind of feature. But, um, but in terms of the growth um, strategy, the, that does seem to be uh, somewhat comparable, so that, that's pretty interesting. All right, uh, I think that's all I have to say for this story. Um, anything to add? Well, no, just that, I mean, it's, it's kind of nice that we can now have this sort of ontogenetic sequence for mm -hmm. this particular, you know, kind of dinosaur. Yeah. Like, almost, like, perfectly, too. You got a young one, you got a yeah. sub-adult, you got a, a geezer. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly, yeah. And that, that's not, not very common for uh, dinosaurs from this part of the kind of family tree. So, uh, yeah, it, it is a really, really valuable find, I think. All right. So uh, I guess we can go to your second story, then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, this is by uh, Jerome B. Smears and colleagues, and it touches on a long discussion in evolutionary biology, mm -hmm. uh, that of the correlation between brain size, body size, and intelligence. Now, traditionally, it has been thought that the growth of the brain in mammals through their evolutionary history occurs as the body grows in size. Uh, what is known as a linear, linear allometric power law. Uh, so just kind of quote the paper here. The scaling coefficient, or slope, of this allometry is assumed to be relatively stable across vertebrate classes and orders, most often estimated as between two-thirds or three-fourths, and is thought to reflect universal energetic growth constraints. So in other words, as a mammal species evolves, the size of the brain is limited by the size of the animal. Uh, the bigger you get, the bigger your brain gets. The smaller you get, the smaller your brain gets. And the only reason that a small-bodied mammal would grow a large brain is if there were selection pressures, uh, selection pressures acting on the brain itself. Now, it seems simple enough, uh, but there's actually been very little work done on this model and whether it's actually valid based on the evidence. Uh, the most that we really have are those kind of classic encephalization quotients that measure brain size in proportion to body mass, mm -hmm. usually in the context of understanding overall intelligence. So animals with big brains and proportions to their bodies tend to measure high in the sorts of things that researchers studying intelligence look for. We know that, for example, uh, alongside humans and the other primates, the dolphins, elephants, and pack hunting carnivores tend to have larger brain to body mass ratios, and their behavior suggests prominent intelligence. Well, this study chose to do something interesting with this. Rather than simply compare a scattering of disparate mammals with each other, they decided to look at the issue phylogenetically and with help from the fossil record. The authors sampled mammals from across their family tree, uh, about 1,400 species in all, and they gathered data on brain and body proportions. Of course, for the fossil organisms, they had to rely on fairly complete remains and measure their endocranial volume in place of actual brains. So uh, did the authors find this aforementioned correlation of brain growth to body growth and selection for larger brains? Well, the TLDR version is this model is way too simplistic. <laughs> <laughs> so following the end Cretaceous extinction event 66 million years ago, uh, many lineages of mammals that survived and diversified Many lineages of mammals survived and diversified, uh, and there was an overall change on the constraints that limited brain and body growth, you know, given that there were now so many niches left vacant after the non-avian dinosaurs and their neighbors died out. You know, this is not too surprising. Similar environmental impacts, it turns out, do shape these constraints, as different mammal lineages were affected by climatic shifts throughout the Cenozoic era that provided other opportunities for them. What was surprising was the discovery that the road to big brains, and thus intelligence, are not necessarily parallel to each other. 
Among all the large brain intelligent mammals we usually think about, the development of prominent intelligence actually happened in different ways. Mm -hmm. So elephants, belonging to the ancient Afrotheria group, so that includes the sea cows and the tenrecs and the aardvarks and, and among others, they got their big brains simply because they just got larger throughout <laughs> their evolutionary history. Uh, dolphins and the other toothed whales, uh, they can trace their ancestors to terrestrial hoofed mammals. Now, at first, these land animals were doing the same thing that elephants were, but once the ancestors of, cet of cetaceans, so the whales, started invading the oceans, well, both their brains and bodies began to actually diminish in size. Now, once proto-dolphins started to evolve, yet another shift occurred, and the body size actually continued to shrink while the brain grew in size. Um, now, this is in contrast, curiously, to other aquatic lineages, uh, like the pinnipeds, so that's seals and sea lions, and the walrus. Uh, sea lions, in particular, are actually fairly smart animals, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even though they have fairly small brains for their body size. Well, it turns out that during their evolution into aquatic niches, selection pressures forced them to grow larger, fattier bodies, so kind of giving them the illusion that their small brains act like small brains, when in reality their cognition has developed quite highly, mm. you know, just you know, what is needed to navigate such large communities as sea lions do. Now, similarly unique trajectories exist among mammals that contradict this older model. So, for example, under the original model, you, know, you would think that the, the largest mammals on Earth, the baleen whales, they have the biggest brain-to-body ratio of all. But actually, they share the same sorts of ratios as related land ungulates, mm -hmm. like uh, hippos and pigs. In fact, smaller mammals like mice, shrews, bats, and tenrecs actually have more restraints placed on their bodies mm -hmm. than on their brains. And, and their brains can grow in any which way is necessary. So like fruit bats, for example, they show more of an increase in brain size compared to body size than the other bats. Now, when primates are examined, of course, this is naturally relevant to my main interests, <laughs> um, we find that you know, the same sorts of diverse changes were occurring among primates as were the other mammals. So among the earliest primates, you know, we find the same trend seen in other early groups. So both the body and the brain were growing in size following niche expansion at the end of the Cretaceous period. Now, some lineages keep up this trend, uh, lemurs and lorises, for example. But when we reach the apes, and especially the hominins, we see the same trend that dolphins went through. So uh, their bodies decreased in size over time, while the brain increased in mass. Now, given that this study included a number of different extinct hominins, like uh, Australopithecines and Homo erectus, this follows what has been more or less understood mm -hmm. in paleoanthropology. You know, many members of the genus Homo are much less robust than earlier species, and those even more so than related apes like chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of track this growth in the brain through time. However, a bit of an asterisk in this case. Mm. So uh, the uh, anthropologist John Hawks has actually responded to this paper mm. uh, on his blog, and uh, we'll be sure to post a link in the description. And he's under the impression that the data for hominins gives a misleading hmm. um, characterization because it only includes such a small handful of species. Hmm. You know, when you look at the entire hominin fossil record, you find that only in a few cases do you see these larger brain, smaller body trends among hominins over time. Um, it must be kept in mind, of course, that you know, phylogenetic relationships between hominins uh, are not very well known right. and really only now being better understood, you know, as researchers are now actually doing these damn things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, based on what we see, it seems that the allometry of hominins is likely a lot more complicated than what this paper is showing, hmm. so that you have some species that don't match up with this trend, like Homo naledi, hmm. for example. So, yeah, as far as that is concerned, well, we, we definitely need more work on a, a larger sample size to be done. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't negate the overall message of the paper. You know, while the authors state outright that this isn't meant to wholeheartedly debunk the original model, 
they do argue for a reevaluation mm -hmm. of many traditional understandings about the evolution of mammalian intelligence. You know, it turns out that it's not always the case for a mammal with a large brain to body ratio, you know, that it got that way by growing larger. You know, some very smart mammals got that way by decreasing their body size, and others that have smaller brains and larger bodies are actually, you know, no less intelligent than what you would expect hmm. if you were just looking at size alone. And uh, I, I think the closing words of this paper say it best. And I quote, This does not render the study of brain size relative to body size useless. On the contrary, it reframes this trait more broadly to represent comparative differences in adaptive profile, thereby accounting for the complexity and diversity of the underlying processes and ultimately encapsulating aspects beyond cognition and brain size. So I thought this was a really fascinating paper uh, i don't know about you oh i i definitely think so too um it is actually um it's actually a very similar to a paper on uh, birds that basically looked at the same thing uh, that came out last year and i think um they actually share uh, some authors uh, some of the authors between these two studies overlap um oh. And so, yeah, there, last year there was a there was a very similar paper on bird uh, brain size, and they they basically did uh, very similar things, kind of uh, plotting out uh, brain to body size across phylogeny, and also looked at fossils, um, including um, some uh, non bird dinosaurs in there too, um, and uh, just tried tried to see what kind of trends they could uh, find uh, in the evolution of avian brain size, um, and it, it's pretty interesting to to compare these these two studies. Um, because uh, in the other one, they, they also found things like, yeah, large-brained birds uh, have achieved uh, large uh, brain-to-body ratios in, in different ways, like uh, parrots and uh, corvids are, of course, the, the most famous um, large-brained birds, and they, they, they manage to do that in different ways as well, which is kind of parallels uh, what we see here in the large-brained mammals. Um, and something else that kind of surprised me um, was that uh, in this study looking at mammals, I think they identified uh, 30 different, uh, I, I guess we could call them like regimes of kind of brain to body scaling um, ratios. Um, so I, uh, essentially, uh, which um, uh, different, different um, lines of regression, where, like how, how does, how does brains, how do brains scale with a body size basically, and which, uh, um, which species fall along which lines and such, um, and they they found like different um, shifts in in um, mammals, of course, uh, where uh, uh, the scaling relationship uh, has changed, um, and that, that's kind of what the different colors on this um, phylogeny are showing. Uh, the different yeah. colors, yeah, the different colors, uh, or rather, the same colors are showing the the ones that belong to the same kind of scaling regime, um, and they did this in the bird paper too, um, but uh, it turns out that. Uh, it seems that they found many more kind of different uh, scaling relationships in the mammals than in in the birds because I, I think in the in the birds they found something like 11 different um kind of lines of regression that uh, described these uh you know the, these scaling relationships uh whereas i think in mammals they they found something like 30 different <laughs> different slopes <laughs> yeah yeah like that's that's wow uh especially considering that there are so many more species of birds than the mammals there are about twi twice as many uh, bird species as there are mammals uh, but mammals seem so much more um, uh, diverse in terms of the ways that they scale their brain to body ratio. Um, so I, I found that really fascinating. I, I wonder if it's it has I wonder if it's related to, say, flight, for example, where uh, birds are constrained in the way they can scale their, their brain size because they, they also have to uh, manage kind of the, the requirements of flight. Uh, so something something for future study, perhaps. Yeah, I was actually you know thinking the same thing. Um... I mean, the, the plasticity of mammals versus that of birds mm -hmm. uh, and just like how many different body types and, right. and niches mammals have taken. I mean, yeah, with birds, it, you, there are, you know, aquatic birds and there are like, you know, hyper aerial birds and, and you know, there are land birds. Um, but yeah, it's those constraints. Like they're, they're never like, they've never like fully committed. <laughs> so like, like if, 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 well, maybe that's not the right way of putting it, you know, like, like, um, like a, a penguin still has to go on land mm -hmm. to lay eggs. Right. Whereas, you know, mammals, you know, a fully aquatic mammal 
can give birth in the ocean. Right, right. Know, in the case of, of cetaceans. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's that would actually be something really cool to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that plays a big part of it. And uh, I, I do recall the paper talking a little bit about that as well, the, 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 the plasticity of mammals. And because like for a lot of these like these growth regimes, um, like a lot of the, like a lot of different lineages basically retained the same sort of right. growth, like the growth pattern where like the brain increases as the body increases over time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned elephants, of course, but like a lot of different like Afro theorians, um, I, I think the lagomorphs, which is the rabbits, mm -hmm. um, some of the hook mammals basically kept that same trend. And, right. and that does kind of match what you see in the fossil record. Um, I mean, a, a lot of the famous case studies of like horse evolution, for mm. example, in general, not always, but in general, like horses have gotten bigger over time. Right, right. The rhinos have gotten bigger over time. Uh, the giraffe has gotten bigger over time. And so like that, that kind of makes sense. Like looking at this paper and then looking at the fossil record, which... Um, I know in the supplementary material they list all the fossils, and I, oh, I wish I, I dug into that before this, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's clear that their, their fossil sample size is pretty good. For right, something. right, right. So yeah, that, that's I, I definitely look forward to more research on this end. Um, but for the moment, that's all I really have to say about this. Uh, unless you have anything else you'd like to add, we can jump to your final story. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have much to add. Just that it is a really cool study, and it makes a great uh, kind of a, a sister study to the to the bird study from last year. So, yeah, it, it was it was really cool to see this. Um, but, uh, yeah, let's uh, move on to the next um, story and the, our final story for this episode. Uh, we're going to stay with mammals, or at least uh, near mammals. Um <laughs> But uh, we're we're going back to the to the Joho biota in the early Cretaceous, um, so these are um, two more new fossil specimens um, found from that biota, um, but uh, this time uh, not dinosaurs, uh, but uh, a mammal and a and a near mammal, uh, you could say. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, these two are both from the Joho biota, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, the um, this biota has given us not only uh, dinosaur fossils, but also other small vertebrate fossils as well, well mo mostly small, um, including various early uh, mammals and their close relatives. And um, something, um, you know, that is uh, often kind of uh, depicted in popular culture is uh, um, mammals during the age of dinosaurs are considered uh, not very diverse and all, all kind of doing the same thing. Uh, basically, they're, they're depicted as... Uh, small very shrew like um, insectivorous uh, creatures um and that that has been kind of the traditional view for a long time but uh but what we're finding with the help of a lot of these uh, uh mesozoic lagerstatten that have come to light in recent years including the various uh, joho biota formations um is that uh, mesozoic mammals and their close relatives uh were very diverse actually so and not only in terms of uh, uh phylogenetically uh, so there were a lot of um uh, different groups of uh, mammals around at, during the Mesozoic, um, and many of them uh, actually did not make it past the uh, you know, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, or even if they did, they kind of barely did and died out not not long after. Um, there there were a lot of uh, kind of unique groups that were around at the time that are not really anything like what we see today, um, and not only that, but also ecologically they they also were also um, a lot more diverse than we tend to appreciate as well. Uh, so they they weren't all just like you know very general generalized shrew like animals, uh, but they were doing all kinds of interesting things ecologically, um, like they they were like burrowing species and semi-aquatic species and gliding species and so on. Um, now, it's true that they all were generally confined to small body sizes. Uh, so, so far, we haven't found any uh, Mesozoic mammals that were bigger than around uh, the size of a, a badger or so. Um, but within that, uh, within that kind of constraint, uh, they did a lot of things with it. Um, and so these new fossils kind of uh, add more to, to that picture. Um, so these two fossils, even though they both belong to uh, uh, assemblages that are considered, you know, Joho biota, uh, they come from two different formations uh, in that assemblage. Uh, so one of them is Fossil Manis, uh, which comes from the Jofo Tongue formation, uh, which is the same formation as that the little baby uh, Archaeorhynchus, um, and thing as well as things like Microraptor. Um, and then the other specimen here is called uh, Draconodon. Um, this one is from a, a slightly older uh, formation called the Yishin formation, and um, 
this formation uh, is the one that gave us things like the uh, Sinoceropteryx, uh, the first uh, non-bird dinosaur to be uh, described, preserved with feathers, um, and identified as such. Uh, or also things like a Caudipteryx, which was one of the another um, among the first uh, non-avian dinosaurs described with feathers. And uh, yeah, one of the first that was described with not just kind of uh, proto feathers or kind of fuzzy kind of feathers, uh, but uh, Feathers very similar to what you see in a modern bird today, uh, complex uh, you know, flight feathers, even though it was probably a flightless dinosaur. Um, and so uh, Draconodon uh, comes from the Eshin formation, which is the same one as, as Lowe's uh, famous uh, feather dinosaurs. Now, uh, these two different uh, fossils uh, come from pretty different parts of the mammal family tree, and actually, you know, not, not just mammals as we shall see, because um, Fossiomanus. Um, which basically means digging hand, uh, gives you a clue as to what makes it interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, it is a, a member of a group called the Tritylodontids, and this is a group that is a very closely related to mammals, and they, they, are, they were very similar to mammals overall. They were these generally uh, small-bodied animals, um, and uh, yeah, if you, if you saw one in life, now, we're not sure if they had fur or not, but uh, I would say it's a pretty good bet that they probably did. Um, and uh, if you saw one in life, you probably would consider it to be a mammal. Um, they did have some differences from true mammals. Uh, for example, uh, in modern mammals, we only replace our teeth once, uh, as we probably know very well. Uh, you have your baby teeth, and then they fall out, and you grow in your adult teeth, and that's it. Uh, whereas in Tritylodontids, uh, they were replacing their teeth throughout their life, and they had a very interesting system of replacing their teeth. Uh, they have a system that we call a conveyor belt kind of like system. Uh, so the new teeth would pop in from the back of the jaw, and then they would kind of slowly move forward as the uh, teeth oh. towards the front of the jaw were worn away. Um, so yeah, that's a very uh, very distinctive way of replacing their teeth. Um, and they were able to do this you know, throughout their lives. They weren't just stuck with two sets of teeth, uh, unlike true mammals but otherwise you know they, they were fairly mammal like um, and so uh, we say that they are mammalia morphs uh, which is a group that includes uh, mammals and also some of their closest relatives like the tritylodontids um, but uh, they were non-mammalian mammalia morphs so they weren't true mammals um, whereas a uh, Draconodon uh, was probably a true mammal. Uh, it belonged to a group called the Eutriconodonts, uh, which were a group of Mesozoic mammals that were extremely diverse. Um, so uh, they included things like um, Rapinomammus, which is another um, uh, Eshin formation uh, Mesozoic mammal, and uh, one of the largest Mesozoic mammals we know of, one of those badger-sized ones. Um, and in fact, uh, there is evidence that one of uh, the... Um, specimens we have of uh, Rapino mammals um, ate a baby uh, Cetacosaurus, a baby, uh, a baby non-avian <laughs> dinosaur. Yeah, uh, with uh, it was found with the bones of uh, the Cetacosaurus in its gut. Um, so yeah, if, if you're not familiar with Cetacosaurus, um, it, it's actually um, an early relative of things like Triceratops, although it was much smaller. So um, you know, uh, Cetacosaurus got to around between a between a meter to two meters long or so. Um, so uh, it's quite a small dinosaur, smaller than a person, although still much, much larger than most of Mesozoic mammals. Um, and uh, yeah, it turns out that uh, um, uh, Rapinomamus was preying on its juveniles. Um, and also a Cetacosaurus, unlike Triceratops, was probably bipedal and uh, uh, didn't have uh, big horns on its face or anything. It did have a two little horns on its cheeks, which uh, actually Triceratops and its close relatives also have. Um, and it has a kind of parrot-like beak. That's why its name means a parrot lizard. Um, but yeah, uh, quite, quite, a, quite a different kind of sort of body plan from what we expect of the later horned dinosaurs. Uh, but in any case, yeah, the Eutriconodonts were pretty diverse. You had things like Rapinomammus. Um, earlier, uh, during the Jurassic, uh, you had uh, things like Volaticotherium, uh, which was a gliding uh, Eutriconodont. Um, and uh, from the early Cretaceous of Spain, there's a Eutriconodont known called um, Spinalestes, which uh, it also happens to be found from another, another um, Lagersatin that preserves the soft tissues. And so we, uh, it actually has a really interesting kind of soft tissues, uh, Spinalestes. Um, it not only has fur, but it also has 
uh, kind of spiny kind of hairs, like not not just like normal mammalian hairs, but also like sort of a bristle-like spines. Um, and it also has little armor plates, it seems, like in its skin. So it has a sort of mixture of all kinds of different types of uh, skin covering, which is really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Incidentally, a Spinalestes is also um, the earliest mammal to be preserved with uh, an outer ear, or what we call a pinna. So you know the, the little flappy things that you're that you think of as as your ears. Uh, that that's a that's a mammal thing, but we don't really know uh, when it evolved in mammals. But uh, we do know that. Uh, um, Spinalestes, a eutriconodont from the early Cretaceous, is the earliest example of one preserved in the fossil record. A little ear flap. Yeah, so that, that's a pretty pretty interesting landmark. Um, but yeah, in any case, uh, Draconodon was yet another eutriconodon, and it adds even more to the kind of ecological diversity of uh, these uh, these mammals. So I say a true mammal, probably, because there, there have been a few recent analyses that put eutriconodonts outside of true mammals, but a m majority of, of, of studies consider them to be true mammals, and uh, including this one. So uh, yeah, I, I think um, for, for now, it seems that a true mammal is a leading hypothesis for their relationships. And uh, in any case, uh, both of these uh, fossils were uh, described in the same paper, and uh, they even though they are very different uh, phylogenetically, uh, they share an uh, interesting common theme, is that both of them exhibit uh, digging specializations. Um, and now previously, um, uh, we have known of um, some other possible um, species of uh, Mesozoic uh, mammaliomorphs that could probably dig. Um, and in fact, we, we do have a few um, other uh, digging specialists from other parts of the family tree. So uh, uh, there's a late Jurassic one called a Doko Fosser that seems to have been a, a digging specialist. Um, uh, another late Jurassic one from uh, North America called a Fruta Fosser, which also has these like really kind of jacked up forelimbs. Uh, it also seems to have been a specialized digger. But uh, in, in a lot of other cases, uh, it's more like uh, some animals that show uh, signs of having being able to dig, but maybe not uh, particularly specialized for doing so. So maybe they could dig burrows to kind of live in and rest during uh, presumably the day. Uh, it is often thought that a lot of these early uh, mammals were probably nocturnal. Um, so you know they they could they could dig uh, dig well enough to to make themselves a home, but they probably weren't like primarily traveling by digging through the soil or um, uh, you know spending most of their lives underground. Um, Whereas in um, uh, Doko Fosser that I mentioned earlier, a maybe fruit of Fosser, and, uh, and probably in these two new species, uh, Fossiomanus and Draconodon, uh, these were digging specialists that really were spending like a lot of their time just underground, out of sight. Um, and some of the evidence for this uh, comes from their forelimb anatomy. Uh, like, um, animals that are specialized for digging tend to have a very... Uh, distinctive um, features of the forelimb to help them do so. So for example, the, the tip of the humerus, the upper arm bone tends to be very wide for attaching like these big muscles. Um, the um, the olecranon process on the ulna, what we call our funny bone, so the part kind of sticks out back out of your elbow, um, um, that, that part tends to be very um, well developed in digging animals and certainly is the case in these two species here. Um, and uh, that, that's also for attachment of these big muscles to kind of uh, help break up the soil or whatever else they're digging digging in. Um, and their hands uh, tend to be very broad and shovel-like, so that has uh, obvious uh, kind of advantages for digging. Uh, and the claws are very robust uh, and sharp at the end, so they can kind of dig into the soil and uh, break it break it apart and then shovel it out. Um, and so these are all very common features found in digging specialists, and uh, they're definitely seen here. Um, now, the, um, the skull of uh, Fossiomanus, Fossiomanus is on the left here, is preserved um, upside down. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the body in general is preserved upside down, so we can't really see the top of the head. But um, in Draconodon, it's preserved uh, on, on its belly, basically, so we can see it from the, from the top down. And uh, its eye sockets are very, very small. So uh, like in a lot of um, primarily subterranean mammals today, their eyes probably weren't very well developed in this species, um, which also kind of matches well with the, the kind of inference of its ecology. And so, um, uh, you know, because I mentioned a docophosa earlier, the, these aren't quite the first um, Mesozoic mammalian morphs that were uh, to be identified as digging specialists, uh, but 
they do seem to be the first such examples from the Zhehe biota. Um, and I, I think they are also the first uh, tritylodontid and eutriconodont to be identified with such uh, ecologies as well. So yeah, they, they really greatly expand this kind of uh, uh, our knowledge of the ecological diversity of these groups. Um, so something else that's um, kind of notable is that uh, I, I guess it's it's not a it's not a huge surprise that we'd see this digging ecology pop up over and over again in Mesozoic mammalia morphs uh, because it certainly has in modern mammal groups um, as you're probably familiar with, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so of course we have things like um, moles. Uh, so moles are probably the most famous kind of really specialized burrowing uh, mammals. But then you have groups like the golden moles, which are more closely related to elephants than to true moles. Um, mm -hmm. You have like a bunch of groups of uh, digging rodents. You have uh, uh, several groups that are called mole rats that are not closely related to each other. You have, um, for example, the, the naked mole rat and its close relatives uh, that are closely related to things like guinea pigs and porcupines. You have a group called the, um, uh, the blind mole rats, which are more closely related to mice and rats. Um, you have things like uh, gophers, which are also primarily subterranean, uh, and they're, they're more closely related to uh, beavers than to uh, the other rodents I mentioned earlier. Um, there's a South American group of rodents called the Tuco Tucos, uh, again, similar story there. So yeah, all kinds of uh, burrowing specialists in modern mammals independently. Oh, and there's a, the marsupial mole as well, so a, a non-placental mammal that has occupied such a, such a niche. And so uh, yeah, I guess it, it's, not a, it's not a big surprise that we see this pop up over and over again in different uh, Mesozoic uh, mammalian morph groups. Uh, I guess if you, if you were wondering, uh, Docovosser uh, is not a tritylodontid or a eutriconodont, but uh, what we call a docodont. Um, and docodonts appear to have been another group of uh, not quite mammals, so they are very closely related to true mammals. Uh, in fact, they're, they're even closer than the um, uh, tritylodontids are, but uh, yeah, they're not quite within the true mammal group. Um, and Frutifosser appears to have been uh, uh, an early, a, a true mammal, but not a member of any of the major groups of, of mammals that have been identified. So yeah, it's, a, it's kind of weird, weird one doing its own thing. Um, so yeah, again, at, at these four different origins of this kind of lifestyle, Mesozoic mammals uh, or mammalian morphs, and um, uh, definitely uh, several different origins of it in, in modern mammals too. Um, now, one more thing I'll, I would like to note is that um, so tritylodontids, um, we did know about them from the early Cretaceous before, uh, so they are they are known from since the Triassic actually, so they, they are an old group, and uh, the youngest known specimens are from the early Cretaceous, and in fact uh, Fossiomanus might be the youngest one that we know of. Um, and so because we knew of them from the early Cretaceous, uh, we've always known for a while that they're kind of the, probably the last surviving uh, non- mammalian synapsids. Uh, so synapsids are like, like the group that includes everything more closely related to mammals than to reptiles. Um, and they, they include things like the sailback dimetrodon, dimetrodon from back in the Permian before the Mesozoic. Um, mm. And so the tritylodontids, uh, we've, we've known that they probably are the last surviving uh, non-mammalian uh, synapsids. Um, and so people have always been saying, wouldn't it be, it'd be great uh, since they're of the right age for us to get uh, tritylodontid from the Zhoho biota, and then we could have these soft tissues that would show us whether they had fur or not, and we could, you know, have a better idea of when fur evolved in, in the mammal lineage. Great idea, and we finally have this wonderful fossil of a tritylodontid from the Zhoho biota, but there's a snag, and that is it doesn't preserve any soft tissues at all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in fact, uh, neither of these specimens do preserve soft tissues. So, uh, yeah, even in the Zhehe biota, not not all specimens preserve soft tissues, and this is the, unfortunately the case here. So these are wonderful specimens, but yeah, they still don't uh, they still don't really solve the mystery of whether tritylodontids had hair or not. Um, so yeah, that's unfortunate. Well, hopefully we'll find another one, and maybe that one will, will tell us. But uh, we do know they were around now, uh, so yeah, uh, there's definitely a chance of that. Um, yeah, so. Uh, do you have anything else to add? I love how the fossil on the right. Yeah. It's like, can you give me a hand? And it's just... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. The, the the fossils in the Joho biota are often uh, often preserving kind of funny postures. It, it's also kind of morbid to say this about you know dead dead animals, but but <laughs> yeah, like because they're they're so complete and oftentimes uh, most of the bones are still, you know, preserved in life positions like like connected to each other. Uh, but occasionally you get things like like 
like list where like you know one of the parts is kind of drifted off and, and yeah, yeah kind of funny um so yeah i uh something else that the paper mentions actually the paper spends um, a lot of time talking about how uh, both of these species have a, a longer vertebral columns they have more vertebrae than their close relatives do so than other tritylodontids or other eutriconodonts do um and they they talk quite a lot about uh you know speculating about uh, different mechanisms of how this could have happened because uh, there have been a lot of studies done on the development of the mammal kind of vertebral column and basically what kind of developmental processes control a number of vertebrae in the length of the vertebral column and all of that um but uh, uh i am not a developmental biologist <laughs> and uh so uh i i you know can't, can't really speak to all the details about that and also i i think uh even though it takes up a big chunk of the paper it, it is necessarily a, a very speculative um so i i don't think I'll, I'll go into much of the detail here uh but you know if you're interested in that uh you know go check out the paper because they actually do talk quite a bit about it um and yeah, um, if you have nothing else to add, I guess we can uh, close this off. Sure. I, I just, I feel like, yeah, the, the non-mammalian synapses are probably one of the most fascinating mm -hmm. uh, 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 fossil groups that I can think about, or one of them at least. Right, just because right. it's, it's, I mean, like, today among mammals, like, the earliest diverging forms that are still around are like the platypus and the echidnas. Right. And, and, and they're so specialized in right. what they do that they don't i mean like they can tell us like they can give us like some help in in, in, in understanding them but mm -hmm. it's to a, a limit right it's like I, I i often wonder like if how cool it would be if we could have like a like a cynodont mm -hmm. or a tilodonta running around that we could yeah even, like, you know one one straggler that, that made it all the way right you know, right we, we could look at and like we're, we're having to like build up these animals from scratch basically mm -hmm. there's still a lot of questions about their biology that we don't know about right um, it's incredible to me i think yeah absolutely i i definitely agree there uh yeah it, it would be amazing to be able to you know see what a, a non-mammalian cynodon look like uh so so technically um we we do have some soft tissues from the other group i mentioned the uh, lodocodonts uh which are which are very close to mammal relatives but not not true mammals and uh we, we do have evidence of fur in those guys um because uh, there, there have been some preserved in Lagerstaden that do preserve uh, soft tissues, um, but yeah, but you know they're they're, they're so mammal like they're they're basically honorary mammals. Um, it, it definitely would be you know very interesting to see what an even more distant mammal relative look like, and uh, yeah, that definitely definitely would be super cool. Uh, we really need that Triassic Lagerstaden with the with land uh, land vertebrates in it, you know, that preserving soft tissues. That would be wonderful. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> that is that is. <laughs> Alrighty, uh, but uh, I guess uh, that is all. Um, let's uh, go on to our uh, kind of ending slides. Uh, as always, uh, we're going to thank our friends, uh, Henry and Alicia, because uh, they, they always contribute to our episodes with their uh, contributions. Um, and uh, if you enjoyed this episode, uh, please follow us on Twitter. We'll keep you up to date whenever we release a new episode. Of course, you could just subscribe to our YouTube channel anyways. Uh, that's probably the most uh, direct way to to follow us um you know we we love receiving comments and uh, questions so if you have any please please uh leave a comment on the video or uh, send us an email if you like uh of course we will always um you know we as always uh, we will uh, add uh, links to all the papers we talked about today uh in the description um, all right, so uh, next week uh, we're going to return to our series, uh, and in particular uh, we're going to go back to a uh, Jones series on human evolution. Um, and so what are we looking for, uh, looking forward to uh, for that one? Well, we're going to look at the, um, the development of agriculture around the world and uh, its impacts on human societies, uh, including a very fascinating topic regarding the origin and spread of various language families around mm -hmm. the world, which is closely tied to that particular event in human history so huh. it's going to be quite a, a an exciting episode to talk about for sure yeah i can imagine well we are looking forward to that so uh, stay tuned and uh you know until next time take care yep see y'all later